Hello everyone, I'm Christina Torsain, Executive Committee Member at Protect Non and Senior Associate. I'm really pleased to be joined by Dr. Chrissy Gale, the International Lead at Celsius of the University of Strathclyde. Dr. Gale developed the MOOC, the massive open online course that will be running on unaccompanied and separated children, children on the move. And we wanted to take some time today to speak with Chrissy about ever so important work that she's developed. Welcome, Chrissy. Hello, nice to be with you today. Um, it's quite interesting to hear myself referred to as a doctor, because as you know, Christina, from our, our past working together, I actually spent 26 years on the front line as an international aid worker as well. So um, it's been interesting to, to combine my experience and now working in, in a university setting. We'd be particularly interested to hear about how the course was developed and some of the challenges there. Can you tell us a bit about the purpose of the course and who it has been developed for? A bit of your vision? This is a MOOC commissioned by the task force of 16 international humanitarian development and child protection agencies because there was a recognition for the need to improve the alternative care protection support to unaccompanied and separated children, refugee and migrant children who are moving across and between countries. So for example, uh, UNICEF survey of children who'd moved as un unaccompanied and separated children found that over 38% of the children who took part in this survey had never come into contact with any service or any individual who helped them on their journey. That's almost 40% of children who are traveling as unaccompanied and separated children have not received any support. And in fact, um, I undertook quite a lot of research before developing the content of the course. So I interviewed unaccompanied and separated children. Um, I sent out a questionnaire worldwide to frontline workers and conducted semi-structured interviews with them. And I also undertook a really significant desk review of, of, of reports and other documents. And that provided um, a real confirmation that very often the only person children come into contact with the smugglers. And that actually, these are the only people who give them information and children say, we didn't know where we were, we didn't know which country we were in, we didn't know where to go to. So in recognition of this lack of access to suitable care and other services, um, this MOOC was really proposed. And a real uh, also need to prevent unnecessary separation of children who are actually moving with parents or legal and customary gu um, guardians but also that frontline work workers need to see and recognise risks that children might be facing even when they are in the care of caregivers and they may require intervention and protection measures. So the purpose of the course really is to reach out across the world to try and improve our response to unaccompanied separated children on the move. And in particular, the topics that are covered by this MOOC are that of suitable alternative care and how we can make sure children have access to that. And also how once in alternative care, this can also provide access to protection and other support services they need, including education, health, psychosocial, etc. So the course really is targeted at anyone who comes into contact with or has any sort of responsibility for unaccompanied and separated children on the move, whether before they leave their, their, their hometown or home country, whilst in transit and also a country of final destination. So this could be um, social workers, care providers, teachers, doctors, border officials who play a very important role in children's lives, uh, these children's lives, um, lawyers, judges making legal decisions, interpreters, translators, anyone who might be a policymaker, a legislator, who hold a responsibility for ensuring these children have the care, support and protection they need. In particular, the topics that we're covering in the course are those that really require an intersectoral approach, cross-border approach, coordination and communication between these different providers. Um, and, and helping them understand why children are on the move, because there's a lot of stigma and discrimination even amongst, you know, workers yes. who don't really appreciate the reasons why children are fleeing. Um, it's not necessarily just war. It could be all sorts of persecution and abuse within their own local society, such as uh, young girls are leaving Nigeria because of, of fear of rape, early marriage, etc., um, and how we can use international treaties and standards to inform our everyday work and our response jointly in a child-friendly and holistic manner. 
and then what is sort of suitable care, how do we develop that and how do we make sure we uh, jointly assess the needs and, and circumstances of children so they do research, receive all the best services and alternative care and protection they require. In so many places around the world, this is just one of the top um, social service issues and public policy issues, isn't it? And, and I think one of the difficulties we're finding, and, and certainly my, you know, I did a lot of research. I did at least six to eight months research before developing the course modules, because I think it's really essential that, you know, we provide what is really needed based on, on you know, real life experience of children. And there is most definitely this issue that rights are not being, that are not crossing borders with children. The response, so not just that we have a rising number of children on the move, but there also there are children who've been, you know, there are many places where south to south migration that's just not being recognised and identified, but it's been going on for many, many years. But also the fact, as I said, that rights are not crossing borders with children. So there's very, very, a lot of discrimination against these children in terms of how they're looked after and cared for. And one of the reasons children don't want to come into contact with us is they have this fear now. They don't trust us. Um, and it's the manner in which we provide those services is what children said, told me time and time again that's most important. So a, a remarkably ambitious course. I think MOOCs are increasingly, um, increasingly popular. Um, and so this one is scheduled to start at the end of May, right? It runs for six weeks and it's divided into six weekly modules which are open on consecutive Mondays starting May the 27th. The, the money we've raised from donors and we're really grateful to the task force agency members and also um, the Spanish and uh, sorry, the Swiss and the German government for sponsoring this MOOC means we've been able to develop it and make it totally free of charge. It'll also be accessible in English, Spanish, French and Arabic. Um, so that we can reach as many people across the world as possible. And also importantly, as you said, you and I have been frontline workers, when you're in the middle of a crisis or even if you're an everyday, you know, in, in an everyday situation, finding time to learn, to take time out of your busy day is really, really difficult. So the idea of, of a MOOC is that people can go in and out. The learning is flexible. Uh, it's important that the, the different learning methodologies are very easy and accessible to use. So once the course week opens, any time of the day and night, um, a learner can go in for 10 minutes, do 10 minutes, go back to half an hour. So they can work their own through their own pace through, through those course pages, really. All the information. So we've made a lot of um, teaching videos that have lots of explanation of real life promising practice from around the world. We've actually gone around the world and filmed these videos specifically to illustrate the course. Because I think, again, as you, you and I know, you can read a lot of case studies, but you want to think, what does this feel like? What does it actually look like? What do the people inside working do? Um, so that also allows people to watch those videos in the four languages. But again, they can go in and out of them, stop them, start them. Um, so it's really important that learners feel able to use the course how they wish and to do as much learning or not. So there are also additional reference and reading materials on each course page. So a course week is approximately two hours of learning with an additional two hours of reading, but that's up to people when and how they want to do that. And I do think in terms of accessibility, the fact that the course is free and the fact that it's offered at the same time, you know, whether you're a Spanish speaker, French, uh, Arabic or English, I mean, that's absolutely phenomenal. Uh, and one of the really, for me, important um, aspects of this course as well is we have a discussion board. And what we do is we really promote interaction across le between learners all around the world. Um, and I will be facilitating the course while it's open and running. And not only will I be posing questions to learners, but I will be le working with French, Spanish and Arabic translators so that people can pose questions, can pose comments, and I can also help them interact with other learners. So maybe somebody from Ethiopia is talking to somebody in Thailand or Canada, sharing their ideas and experience. Um, and we can help translate all those comments so that other people can join in those conversations. That to, to be able to do that learning 
across the board right now in, in whatever one's preferred language is, is, is absolutely phenomenal. Will the, out of curiosity, will the translators, are they from the University of Strathclyde or are they from another organization? So two of the translators that work with me are from the university, um, but we wanted an Arabic translator who had experience working in this particular topic. So we're working with an external Arabic translator who has just worked with us to translate Moving Forward, which was, is the handbook that CELS has produced to accompany the UN guidelines for the alternative care of children. And because he's gone through that experience and he's also worked um, in the field with other care practitioners. So he's very aware of the terminology. How did the idea for the course develop? So actually, uh, the idea of the MOOC and the task force was initiated by a really good friend of mine and colleague, Mia Dambach, at the International Social Service. Um, and she and I, at the same time, I'd been doing some work in Celsius at the University of Strathclyde around the issue, especially around uh, alternative care and children on the move, that really indicated that there were many practitioners out there who really wanted to upgrade their learning and knowledge and skills. I mean, I have to pay tribute to them. They do their absolute utmost that they can, but there is recognition that they wanted more, more information. So Mia and I had sort of long discussions about this and looked at the evidence and, and had a conviction this course was badly needed. And Mia was able to, um, you know, find different um, international organizations who also agreed with us and bring this task force of agencies together and instigate the course. That's brilliant, brilliant. Um, there's some remarkably exciting work coming out of Celsius at the University of Strathclyde. It's incredible how there's both a domestic focus but also that international focus with such level of expertise. So um, I feel very privileged and fortunate to work in Celsius. I am surrounded by colleagues with immense knowledge and, and, and information, and it's a real mixture of research, academics, but also practitioners. I mean, the big thing about Celsius is about taking evidence and turning it into practice. So using learning, but making it very practical. Um, that means we can also sort of use information coming out of international, out of the international scene into Scotland and learn from Scotland and, and other colleagues and use that in our international work. So it's, it's a great opportunity to interact and, and use evidence and learning to inform practice and vice versa. And um, you've mentioned Future Learn, which is part of the Open University. And I believe this is the third collaboration between um, Celsius and FutureLearn? Yeah, that's correct. So Celsius, uh, so FutureLearn, as you said, is a part of the Open University and it's the platform that the university uses for all its MOOCs. Um, and because FutureLearn has a very um, high reputation for its professionalism and also has a massive international reach. Celsius has now produced three MOOCs, although the university has provided many others, but ours have been specifically around um, risks and vulnerabilities of children, child protection. Um, a colleague of mine, the first MOOC was around children at risk and social pedagogy. Um, I produced the previous MOOC that's still running um, and it'll be run next year for its fourth time, which is really based on interpreting the UN guidelines for the alternative care of children. And um, that's you know we we very much rely on on the future learn to provide the platform the framework we work closely with them on quality assurance we also listen very carefully to them about their advice and their research on best learning methodologies what they're learning from other MOOCs and how people learn um, but then we're also being able to push future learn as well a little bit as I said you know we have things on our, on this MOOC that have never been done before by FutureLearn. So it, it's quite an adventure and a journey together. Um, and I also work with a um, at Celsius with a learning technologist. So Sarah actually takes my all the course material that I develop with colleagues and she physically builds that um, on the framework that FutureLearn platform provide. It's almost like putting pieces into a sort of jigsaw puzzle frame. Okay. Um, so there's there's a set way of building um, a MOOC, if you like. So um, she works with me on that. And then, as I say, uh, FutureLearn do um, quality assessments. They're also helping us with all the translation, the subtitling. Running for such a period, you know, with a six week run, you can step back, you can throw yourself into it, 
you can the, the ideas can percolate right and you can have that time to have that uh, rapport as you say discuss with someone in another country ask a question ask a question of policymakers who are taking a course you know so i think as well yeah i'm it can be, it, just to say as well, there will be five runs of this course over the next two and a half years. Wow. So if people wow. miss this run or they don't complete it, they can they can sign in again. Um, the other great piece of news is Future Learn have just opened a new what's called a sponsorship package. So we were able to raise the money to sponsor the course for learners. So if they complete the course, the certification for this time will be actually free for them, whereas normally they'd have to pay for the certificates. Um, and yeah, they can open it up on a tablet, on a on a computer. In one of our previous MOOCs, we had um, six learners join the Ebola crisis in Sierra Leone, doing it together on somebody's mobile phone. So yeah. it really is, you know, important that we make it that access accessible. It's incredible, though, how there's such a focus on accessibility, which is really thought provoking on so many different levels. Um, I, I wanted to ask you a little bit about, you mentioned the research, the, the research that you did for six to eight months, and um, obviously you have tremendous experience all around the world and you have an academic background too, but I'm wondering, you, you mentioned you did some key informant interviews, literature review. Mm -hmm. What was the aim? The aim was to um, assess the the state of play in terms of where the discussion was at, what the needs were, what the gaps were. Well, just if you can um, mention a little bit about your your research vision, the what you were trying to look at there. Well, it, six weeks seems a long time, but in fact, it's not, particularly when it's only a couple of hours learning a week. So it was really important for me to make sure that the course content was informed by actual need. So the I sent a questionnaire out across the world through the task force agencies to frontline practitioners saying, what are your needs? What are your learning needs? What are the challenges? So that we could find out what were the most pressing and urgent needs there. Um, and I also wanted to hear from children themselves specifically not about their own personal experience, because I want to be very ethical and careful about the research with them, but I wanted to hear what they thought should be improved. Why had they not used services? Or if they'd used services, how could they be improved? Because it's, you know, they're, they're the final um, service user. And I also wanted to understand exactly what was happening uh, understand the terminology, how things were being used, what the handbooks were. So I did a, a massive desk review to see what agencies were already publishing, what was the agreed processes, and where were the where was the discord, where were the, where were the issues. So that when we um, when we wrote the course, we absolutely could highlight those specific topics that were either challenging or people said this is something we really really needed more information on. On the other hand, there's one topic, for instance, that came up time and time again, which was psychosocial support. Um, right. And we made a, or I made a very conscious decision that you cannot teach people how to work um, on psychosocial issues to a, to a greater depth on on a on on course line learning. So that's something research I took back to all the agencies and said to the agencies, I think this is something you need to incorporate. In the, in the professional support you give to frontline workers. So it informed what we could and couldn't include in the content. Maybe you could speak uh, a little bit more about some of the colleagues and partners and other stakeholders who were involved in the development of, of MOOC. Yeah, um, so again, it was very important. We had international collaboration and agreement around the issues and about the technical information we were, we were giving. So uh, we were very fortunate. I was fortunate to collaborate with colleagues from Harvard University um, in the XB Center, who've done a lot of work around um, children and migration. So they helped review the course content and the modules and what should go in. Um, we also worked with two international consultants, Dr. Nigel Cantwell, who um, is well known in the alternative care world, and also Mike Dottridge, who has worked on um, the Global Compact for Migration and other major pieces of work. So together with also the different representatives of the task force agencies, which were UNHCR, UNICEF, Ted Isom, Save the Children, IOM, I mean, 
that's just to name a few, um, the International Federation Red Cross and Red Crescent, all that expertise is expertise we built on and got to also them to inform us what they felt should or should not be included. Um, and then I we put down a um, module outline of the key issues and that again was agreed on by all the international colleagues and the task force agencies. And then after that, we I put some meat to the bones, if you like, saying page by page, this is what the course would look like. And at that point, we got general agreement. And then I went ahead and sort of um, wrote the course uh, and the course pages. I was also lucky to be able to raise the money. So we actually asked the task force to provide us evidence of promising practice. And in the end, um, UNICEF helped us um, facilitate filming of examples in Mexico, UNHCR helped us access refugee camps in Ethiopia, and the International Red Cross helped us in Sicily. So, uh, you know, we really built on what people already knew what was happening and what needed to happen from around the world. What were some of the biggest challenges in developing the course? As we all know, one of the challenges is always raising enough funds, and this has been a particularly ambitious MOOC. Um, for two reasons in uh, particular. One is um, making sure that, as I said, the case studies were, were really came alive. So I needed quite a lot of money to go off and do the filming so that the course content was specifically, um, you know, identified and the films identified so they match the course content. And then also putting it into four different languages um, and all the course all the films, we've produced about 40 short films, plus a mini drama, which is in six episodes, uh, which is like a mini Dallas. And each episode comes at the end of each course week and it actually typifies what people have learnt in that week. But it also has cliffhangers, like what will happen next. Um, and so it brings learners along with you and, and open the next week of the course. Um, so that was quite costly. So we had to raise quite a bit of money for that. Um, but I think one of the other biggest issues was when I did a lot of desk research um, mm. and discussion with, with practitioners across the world, I found a lot of confusion around shared terminology. Yes. So, yes. for instance, documentation, identification, registration meant very different things to different people and okay. were represented in different organisation handbooks in different ways. So we, I had to find a way to pull all that together to get general agreement across the agencies um, on, on what this terminology meant. And then also, for instance, you know, how we do proper child protection um, and care assessments. And again, that comes in different ways. So UNHCR has a bid process, as I'm sure lots of people will be aware of, but other agencies had, had other, other methods too. And a lot of that was being adapted around the world when I spoke to frontline practitioners. So again, it, it was amazing how we could get the task force together. And for the first time, I think in, on many occasions, there was a lot of agreement and, and the task force were great in coming around the table and saying, yes, OK, this may be ours, this may be yours. But actually, we agree we have to have some common definitions some common understandings in something like this course. And did the task force meet? Uh, how often did they meet? Every couple of months or? Um, so they met every couple of months. So the task force was actually situated in Geneva. So we had meetings in person and then we had quite a lot of um, Skype meetings right. yeah. uh, because some people were obviously in, in other countries in New York, Washington, etc. And also um, we are now doing a lot of so we have a whole communications and publicity kit. So we've also had meetings in Geneva around that. So, yeah, probably once every couple of months, but also regular communication yeah. through emails and other things like that. Yeah, no, it's remarkable because I believe there was a, um, a press conference or uh, and a statement that came out a few weeks ago. So the word is really getting out and then different platforms, whether it's the Alliance um, for Child Protection or um, Protect Non or mm -hmm. other, you know, UNICEF, UNHCR, everyone's spreading the word um, about this opportunity. I think it'll be really interesting to see as you say, it's fantastic that this MOOC will be run a number of times over the course of the next few years. It'll be really interesting to see who signs up to take it for this first batch. Um, 
in our previous MOOCs, we, we've had a, a real mix and we hope we can get the same again from, you know, international organisations, national NGOs and, and governments, um, government departments. And, and we really feel that that's also important because it brings those people together to appreciate each other's challenges, to be able to talk to each other, which sometimes doesn't even happen within a country. Um, and, and one of the messages we have in the MOOC is that we should all be working within national child protection systems and, and, and laws and, and, and um, treaties, et cetera. So I think it's important we all have a shared understanding and we can do courses like this together so that when we go out and work together, we've got a much better understanding of each other's roles and responsibilities. And um, I think there's a number of us who recognize the role of the national child protection system, mm. but clearly, there, there are gaps, there are gaps. And so yeah. to reiterate that, discuss that, yeah. learn best practice and also learn about challenges, right? Mm -hmm. if, if another country, if colleagues have gone through this or are going through it, what are immediate takeaways or what can we learn so that in one's own situation um, that you can try and mitigate that? I mean, in the last MOOC that I ran, which was one on the UN guidelines for alternative care, we had um, over 30,600 30, comments on the discussion board from 147 countries. So it was really people interacting, which was ex which was exceptionally good. Brilliant. And um, it will be fascinating to see who takes the course and also what languages they're interested in accessing yeah. because I think there hasn't been this opportunity to to do um, a course in Arabic at the same time or or French. You know. Any particular main lessons you wanted to share about the development of the MOOC? I'm sure there's a lot. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this this has been uh, over a year in the making. So, it, you know, um, and I think that's important. I think give yourself time to accurately research the learning needs, the challenges, who your target audience is and exactly what they want from you and, and the ways that they feel most comfortable with learning. Um, I think thinking very carefully about the tone of the course. So, for example, I hope I've written this this course at a level that will appeal to all range of different types of workers, but also, you know, some may have like paraprofessionals or some will have different educational um, attainment already. But, you know, we want to open it up to everybody. So it's about thinking about that very carefully. Um, and I think the interaction during the course, very often people can take online courses, but maybe you're just feeling as though you're, you're walking to an empty void. So as the course tutor, um, I engage every single day while the course is running with learners. I read all the comments. I, I make sure the, the learners know I've read their comments because there's like a there's a button you can press that says a like comment or I respond back or I ask questions. So what we've heard is we have a, in our previous mix we have a very very high percentage of social learning interaction in comparison to other MOOCs and so I think that's very important for people to think about how they can actually make this a real live um, interaction for people uh, and I'd say be ambitious I mean children deserve the best we can provide and if this course is the only opportunity someone on working on a, as a border guard you know, on the Eritrean Ethiopian border has the opportunity to learn, then, you know, make it exciting, make it interesting and make it accessible. I had one final question and then I also wanted to uh, allow you to, to share any other bits that um, you wanted to before we sign off. But um, I, I very much appreciate the comprehensive approach and the focus on accessibility and also there's clearly been support and and technical contribution from the task force and you've done this extensive research uh, as part of the preparatory phase how did it work in terms of the the ethical guidelines and also the discussions with children or the interviews with children in terms of how did you factor that into the the planning so um, I was very conscious of 
<clears throat> making sure that there was informed consent, of course, and that children um, and young people volunteered to take part in the research. So uh, the research was done by by reaching out to different organisations with whom um, children are now in the care of. So, you know, again, we made sure that they were safeguarded during the process and that actually, um, you know, they, they were children who could also have support if they needed it following interviews. But the interviews were very much, as I said, not around their personal experience. I was very careful that that wasn't what we were asking, but really we were asking how can things be improved for children coming behind them, if you like, um, and making sure that the questions were very much about how we valued their personal opinion and, and what they thought we should be doing to improve the services and the access and what they thought some of the barriers were. Um, so it was, it was a careful process. It took quite a long time. Um, sometimes you had to do it through translators, um, but I, again, always making sure it was in a very secure environment. It had been well prepared. Um, that children uh, knew very, you know, had a lot of information about what we were doing and why we were doing it, why we were asking them these questions, um, making sure that, as I said, they had informed consent, that it was voluntary, and that they could withdraw at any point in time. Um, and also, all the information they provided is anonymous. It's it's really been such a pleasure speaking with you today. It's um, really been a pleasure, and this initiative that. Um, Silsis um, and Future Learn is, is doing is just really remarkable, uh, really remarkable. You're, you're to be congratulated on that. Is there anything that you wanted to share with listeners before we wrap up? It would be great if people can help us disseminate this information about the MOOC, really. Um, I mean, a lot of work has been put into it by, uh, you know, many people around the world. Um, and including all the people who allowed us to go into their work and, and film them and give up time and effort and the children who spoke to us, etc. So it would be really great if all the hard work pays off and that we can get this out to as many, many people as possible and to a whole range of people. I mean, some are difficult to reach, such as, you know, border agencies, for instance, border officials. Um, often we can reach, you know, international organisation workers much easier than we can reach government workers. So it's about disseminating this to our national partners and, and to our government partners where possible. So really, I think the only thing to add is I, we'd be really grateful um, if we could get the word out and really try and make a difference for children by... You know, really supporting, as you said, all those very enthusiastic and hardworking people across the world who who really said, you know, Chrissy, we really want this information. We really want to learn because we realise there are things that we can we can do in a different way and we can do better. And and that would be great. All around the world. Unaccompanied and separated refugee and migrant children are making hazardous journeys and taking risks. They need our support. This course will guide us through the skills and knowledge we need to provide alternative care and protection in the best possible way. During the course, you'll have the opportunity to learn from examples of promising practice. Listen to children themselves telling us what they need and hear about the experiences of people working with unaccompanied and separated children in many different situations. Through our discussion board, you'll also have the opportunity to share your own ideas, questions and comments with people all around the world. So please join me on this course, so together we can improve the care and protection these children really need.